Hi everyone and welcome to the Renewable Energy Unit. This is one of my favorite units because not only do we get to see some of the things that we've studied in a real industry, um, but it's an industry I know very well. This is my area of expertise, um, so it's always fun to talk about. Um, as you've probably noticed in the course, I really like data visualizations. I especially like very data rich data visualizations that show a lot of different data. Um, this is one of my favorites. Um, I show this at pretty much any energy talk that I that I give, um, especially to a general audience. Um, it's because it really shows the energy system really well. Um, so the main reason we're going to talk about energy is because it's a um, very hot topic nowadays with trying to switch to renewable energy. But it also, there's a lot of places where we can see how sort of the Industry 4.0 to topics we've been talking about, like AI and IoT and cyber physical systems, um, really can come into play and help to bring about um, more renewable energy. So let's take a look at this chart. So this is a picture of how the United States uses energy. On the left-hand side are all of the energy sources. So you can see solar all the way down to petroleum, like oil. And then on the right side, the pink boxes are all the different uses, so residential, commercial, industrial, and transportation. Um, and then in the middle, we sort of have this intermediary, which is electricity generation, which basically takes in some of the sources and converts it to um, electricity to use in the end uses. Um, so the one thing we really notice about this is that while there is a lot of talk about renewable energy, it's not a huge player right now um, in the energy system. You can see like natural gas, petroleum, and coal um, really are the big three, and they sort of um, overtake wind and solar and whatnot. Okay, so what we're really going to look at is how we change that. So there's lots of reasons we might want to change to renewable energy, which I'm sure most of you, or if not all of you, have heard of. Um, climate change, as well as health effects like asthma, burning fossil fuels, um, and, and possibly um, some, you know, more local sources of um, energy. But um, we're not going to really go over that. We're going to just sort of think about, let's pretend like we want to go to 100% renewable energy. What are going to be the challenges to get there? And then we're really going to examine that through the lens of how do the things that we've discussed in the rest of this class help us overcome those challenges. Okay, um, so this is a sort of a generic talk that I, I, I give. You'll probably notice that. Um, and then, but, we'll, but throughout, I'll be weaving in a lot of the things that we have done in this class. So let's first start with this. So just take a second to look at this picture and see if you recognize it. So this is actually a picture of the 2013 Super Bowl. And half the lights went out in the stadium. I think it was a little after halftime. And it actually really turned the tide of the game. Um, it, it, it was a real momentum stopper for one team. I can't remember even who was playing, unfortunately, off the top of my head. But, um, but what really struck me is I was in the midst of doing a lot of research with renewable energy and of um, thinking about talking about this for the first time and I read an article the next day um, from um, it was opinion piece uh, and, and it was Gregory Boyce um, and he's the CEO of Peabody Energy which is the uh, a large coal company and he said coal is the world's fastest growing major fuel and provides more electricity than any other energy source without coal you might as well turn off half the lights not just for our favorite games but also for our cities shops factories and homes so this really struck me. So I wanted to know really, okay, is this really true? And what are the challenges to, to make this statement false, basically, and to get rid of coal? So again, coal is um, a good player um, in the energy system. It's not as big as natural gas or petroleum. It used to be bigger, actually. Natural gas has overtaken it um, mostly due to price. Um, but still, if you look at electricity generation, it, it makes up a, a, a good portion of the electricity generation. So let's not just think about coal, though. Let's think about getting rid of all fossil fuels in the whole energy system. And what does that look like? 
And we're, first, we're just going to focus on electricity. So, if we, if our goal is 100% renewable electricity, let's see if that goal is achievable and how much would it cost. So that's the big thing. So the first thing we notice is this rejected energy thing over here. Uh, we're not going to delve into this, but really you want to talk about using less energy before you switch it over to renewable energy, because a lot of times that's cheaper. So just as a note, um, we should do efficiency first. Okay, so here's what I see as the four challenges to 100% um, renewable electricity. We're going to dive into resource size first. So um, I've, I'm from Delaware, and I've given this talk all, all up and down Delaware, so this might not be as um, familiar to, to you, those of you who are, aren't familiar with Delaware at all. But the whole state of Delaware, I'll sort of just give you the outline, because it might be hard to see, is, is this. And then if we wanted to cover, and a lot of it's farmland, especially down south, if we wanted to supply all of Delaware's electricity needs, we would have to cover this amount of area with solar power. Um, may seem like a lot, but um, most of this county is farmland, so it would just be a tiny fraction of the farmland in Delaware. If we wanted instead to put offshore wind off the coast of Delaware, that's the area we would need for offshore wind. Um, it's a little deceiving because you can still have space in between the wind turbines, so um, and you can still do things in the middle of that space, some things, so um, it's a little deceiving. Okay, so here's the big sticking point. So back when I first started giving this talk around um, 2013, cost was the huge, huge argument against renewable energy. It turns out that renewable energy has dropped precipitously in cost. So I don't need you to understand this whole um, chart, but I want to point out two things to you. Here is the conventional energy sources down here and how much they sort of cost. The blue is sort of a, a range of cost. Um, you can see nuclear is here, um, some coal is here, um, some gas combined cycle is usually cheapest, that's why natural gas is um, sort of winning the day. But then let's look at some of the other um, things here. Let's look at wind. Wind is generally cheaper than all of the below. And the real thing that's been a huge, just in the past two or three years, is big utility scale solar, which means massive, massive fields of solar. Not on, not on the rooftops, not on parking lots, but massive, massive fields of solar. And they are generally very cheap um, and cheaper than all um, of these sources besides maybe gas combined cycle in some areas. And it's still dropping. So cost is not really a determining factor in this. So we're not really going to talk about, um, so resource size and cost we just covered. Those two challenges we already can see, um, for the United States at least, is going to be easy to do. Um, and for most countries, as long as they look outside their borders to import um, renewable electricity, it would be fine as well. So um, that is the two challenges that we're not going to really look at of how to surmount with um, the technologies we talked about in this class. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the, we talked about resource size and cost in the previous um, slides, and now we're going to talk about intermittency of renewable generation. So intermittency of renewable generation just means that it, um, when the sun shines and when the wind blows, that's when solar and wind produce, right? And it's not always sunny, it's not always windy. So before we talk about intermittency, really, let's t just look at how the electricity system is structured. So we have our sort of customers here. You could see like a residential house or like a small business or whatnot. And they're on um, the distribution grid. So they usually see a substation or, a, a, you know, maybe near your neighborhood or something. And that converts the electricity from these blue lines, which carry really high voltage electricity, to lower voltage that goes into your home and whatnot. Um, and then we have what's called the transmission lines, which are much higher voltages and can go longer distances. Some big industrial factories hook right into this system, and, um, and that's the idea of, of those. And then we usually have the generation station that sort of goes off and, and does that completely. 
the big thing here is that the generating station as well as all the users down the line have to be completely balanced completely and totally balanced so what does that mean what it means is it, you have to balance usage and generation so if I'm using five units of electricity and the generator um, that I'm hooked up to is only producing four, it's going to be an issue. So the generator has to constantly go up and down depending on how I'm using electricity. Um, for fossil fuels, this is actually relatively easy because if we think about like coal or natural gas, with the case of natural gas, there might just be a little valve that I need to turn to feed more gas into the fire. That's how... Um, how power plants work, we just light things on fire basically and then produce steam that turns a turbine. But for renewable generation, this is relatively hard, right? We don't really have that valve that we can control um, for renewable generation. Because like I said before, it's depending on when the sun is shining and when the wind is blowing. So um, we're going to look at some data now just to give you an idea of the, the problem this solves. And we're going to look at data for the PJM grid. So PJM is something called um, an interconnection, which means that anywhere in this map with the blue, um, we are all take part in the same big regional grid. We do interact with other grids, like um, the New York ISO, which is a little bit north of us, as well as the New England ISO, and MISO, which is pictured here as red. Um, but we're just going to look at the data for PJM for this case. We're going to look at some data with heat maps, so I just want to remind you what that is. This is um, a heat map of temperature. Remember, heat maps don't always have to be temperature. Um, and this is for Philadelphia for the year, so just to give you a, um, an idea of um, what that temperature looks like for Philly. And remember, we read this. There's um, 24 data points going up and down, and there's 365 um, lines um, so, so we get 8,760 data points here um, for the year. Okay, so now let's take a look at this one. So let's just see, let's just see if you guys can figure out from what we've been talking about what this might be. So go ahead and pause the video and just see if you can take a guess about what this might be. Okay, so hopefully you guessed that uh, I'd be surprised if a lot of you guys got this right, but this is actually solar power production. So you can see, and if we, you know, the, the axes aren't here on this slide, unfortunately, but if we go back to the other slide, this sort of, this is like late night, this is like early morning, the middle of the chart is summer, um, and sort of the edges of the chart here are winter. So solar panels, solar power um, is nothing during the night, right? And there's some times where there's not much even during the day, you know, really cloudy days or overcast days or when it's snowing or whatnot. And then the peak production is sort of right in midday. And there's longer days in, in the summer, so we get a little bit longer production in the summer. But that's the idea, right? All right, so we have that. So let's see what this other one is. So this um, is much harder to, to, to guess. Um, but this is just in a scenario of actually some research that I've done about the least cost. If we wanted to build a 100% renewable energy system, this is what our renewable energy production would look like with both solar and wind combined. So this is going to be sort of our hypothetical. We can build 100% renewable energy to cover all of our electricity needs. And this is the hypothetical um, generation of that. Okay. So it's better than solar power because it produces most of the time. There are some black areas still, which is a problem. Um, but that's the idea. So that's our generation side, right? And remember, we have to balance that with our usage. And that's what this is. OK, so let's take a look. This is our usage, right? And what this shows, it's kind of like the school data we've looked at before. You can see these horizontal lines of, of lighter blue. That's actually the lighter blue, our weekends. So just because, just like our school, we usually use less energy on the weekends. And then these big red blobs in the summer are probably really hot days or weeks where we're using a lot of air conditioning. Um, and sort of that's the idea. And then in this area, we use a lot of um, um, electricity for heat as well. And these are probably cold days where um, we're using a lot of electricity for heat. Okay. 
So that's electricity usage. So the real challenge with our intermittency issue is we have to transform this pattern with some, some kind of technology. We have to transform this pattern to actually match the load 24-7, 365 at all instances, right? So we have to take something like this and somehow transform it to something like that, okay? So the idea that comes to mind the most easily and most people think of if when given this, this problem is to just use big batteries, right? So we just use, we'll put some big batteries in. When we have some extra, maybe in the winter here, we charge up those batteries. We just make them like a rechargeable battery, right? We charge up those batteries. And then in the summer months, maybe especially in these black areas where we don't have much renewable energy generation, we just take energy out of those batteries and use it, right? And we just do that at all times. If we have a big enough battery, we could definitely do that. The problem is, is that batteries can be expensive. So let's think about some other different solutions that we might employ. So here are some other possible solutions. Demand response, which just means when we really need to conserve electricity, maybe the sun's not shining and the wind's not blowing, we use less somehow. Maybe it's automatic. Maybe we turn. Maybe our thermostats in the summer, they turn up a few degrees so our air conditioning's not running as much. Maybe our lights automatically dim, or maybe we get a... So there's, there's other programs that are... Um, you put something in your outlet and it turns a different color when electricity is more expensive or whatnot. And so you know to not run your washing machine or your uh, dryer at that time. Um, so, so that's definitely one way to do it. Um, and we'll talk about a couple of these other different ways in more uh, detail. So if everybody does some of those things I was just talking about, the demand response stuff, this is just uh, different shapes we can make um, uh, of the load or of the usage. So load is just a uh, synonym for usage. The other possibly th thing we can do is build things in a large geographic area. So um, I'll go through this just a little bit, but not it won't be too, too uh, much. So if we look at offshore wind as an example, all of these this sites, S1 through S11, are just different sites all throughout the Atlantic seaboard, right? And so if we look at sort of a site S2, which is um, off the Florida coast, and a slight site S10, which is, looks like it's off Massachusetts. Um, this percentage is, or this, this graph is showing you what percent of the time, which is the Y axis, are we getting what percent of production out, which is the X axis. So what that shows is that 12, if we just look at S10, 12.8% of the time, we're getting no power output from those wind turbines. That's really bad because for, for um, renewables because you really want them to produce at all times. But then also on the other opposite end of the spectrum, we're getting sort of 14.3% of the time we're getting full production. So we have to cover this gap when we're between uh, and then the other values we're getting between. But we'd rather, much rather have something like the one below here. The one below here, if we average all of these sites throughout the Eastern seaboard, if we average all of these sites, we get a much, we get hardly any times with zero production and hardly any times with a lot of production. We get a much more um, pleasing output here. And that's much easier to balance if we're able to draw all of that energy from all of those different sites. Okay? So that's just for offshore wind. We can also do this if we use a bunch of different renewable generation resources. We've been talking about a lot about wind and solar because that's what really exists in the eastern seaboard. But this is for California, which also has geothermal, and they can do solar thermal, and they have a lot of hydroelectric, too. So you can see they can all add up in different ways to give you um, some balancing on the grid. The other possibility you could do, instead of storing the electricity in, the ba in a battery, you could potentially store cold or store heat. So a good example of this is, um, let's pretend a really windy day it's it's you want to use the energy as much as possible or maybe it's a w really windy night in the summer but you're not using much electricity in, at night in the summer well you make huge blocks of ice and then during the day when maybe the wind dies down you just instead of you running your air conditioning you just run a fan over those blocks of ice so that's actually real product um, right now that happens um, I'm not going to talk about this one so what I want you to think about, 
and what will help you with your assignment for this unit is how would cyber physical systems be employed to make these intermittency solutions work? I talked a little bit about that as we were going through. You also want to talk, think about how these cyber physical systems might use AI as well. So let's just go back through real quick and, and think about that now that we understand. So if we go back to this one with the, with the man response, maybe we have all these little IoT devices on all the light bulbs in all of our buildings, right? And when we're really constrained, when we really need to stop using some electricity, and this could be controlled with AI, right? We turn down those lights a little bit. Or maybe it's that in the hallways, we don't need that light at all, the, at all times, or um, we can name critical lights that we always want on, but then during times of really bad, um, we really need to conserve energy, they can automatically shut off other lights. Okay, so you can think about how those things can happen. This can be the same thing with the thermostats we, we read, right? Um, so that's the sort of idea behind it. Um, with this sort of large geographic area, um, not too big of a deal, but what we, um, or what we could have here, but we could have our generators controlled a little bit, so that way maybe our, our wind turbines would only, if they could produce 100 units of energy right now, Maybe we only set them to produce 97, so that way if we need a little bit more, we can actually have the valve, like what we were talking about with the natural gas, we could actually make them produce a little bit more or less. Um, with, the, with the ice storage or with the, heat, with the heat storage, the same thing, right, as with the sort of demand response, we could have devices that are internet connected that control these things about when to make ice and when to use that ice for air conditioning, and same thing, when to make um, with the fire store, with the heat storage, it's usually just in like a ceramic brick. So when to make that brick hot, and when to blow a fan over it to draw the heat for the building. Um, so, so that's another idea. We actually also do thermal energy storage a lot in hot water heaters already. Um, so that would be by making the water just a little bit hotter when electricity is a little bit uh, more plentiful. Um, so that's just an idea of how those cyber physical systems could be employed to make the solutions work. But I really want you to think about that for your assignment. Okay, so we're still going to talk about some intermittency solutions. We're going to talk one, about one that's not employed yet. So a lot of the ones I talked about before were already employed, maybe not on a large scale. Um, and this one is a little bit employed. It's actually, there's pilot projects being run throughout the globe, but nothing more than that. So this is something called, um, this technology is called vehicle to grid. And the vehicles themselves are called grid integrated vehicles. So let me just talk about what this picture is. Um, and, and what's going on here. So if we look here, these are the sort of generators of this system. So whether it's a nuclear power plant or a coal power plant or something like that, and wind, and they're all going in the transmission system, and then it's going in the distribution system, just like we saw in an earlier um, picture in this lecture. The ISO is that PJM, remember we saw the map of that? They're the sort of gatekeepers. They're the ones who control the whole system now. And so, in this case, may, they, they have one more aspect of control. So a lot of times this ISO really controls the generators, that's what happens nowadays. But now, they, ha they can have more control over different things. So for example, if we just look at this one car in our house, they could communicate to the one car in the house, and they could tell the electric vehicle when to charge. So that would be, um, you know, maybe it's really, really sunny one day and it's a nice spring day, so no one's using electricity, no one's using air conditioning. So then you'd want to charge all the cars you could during that day, right? But the real power of, of what's called vehicle to grid is that they can also draw some energy out of the car as long as the owner of the car um, is okay with that to help balance the grid when there isn't enough electricity being produced. So what they would do is say, hey, we'll pay you, you know, five bucks if we can just draw a little bit of your 
of your battery out. And that could, again, that is going to be controlled with some sort of cyber physical system there, right? And maybe it's a maybe it's that the owner gets a, a smart um, an, an alert on their smartphone, or maybe the owner says, "No, I don't really want to deal with any of that. I just want to be able to drive at X, Y, and Z times for X, Y, and Z distance or whatever it is." And maybe AI would take care of when to charge or when to discharge. Okay, so the idea here is that as long as cars aren't on the road driving, which a majority of the time they aren't, they can basically be used as the batteries about what we were talking about before. Okay, so that's what the vehicle to grid um, system looks like. So again, this is the same, same idea, we just talked about this. Okay, so I want to talk about one more solution here um, for sort of this demand response. We talked about it a little bit but I, um, before, but I want to just show you a little bit more in depth about how it actually works. So a building automation system is the actual system that controls lights, temperature, relative humidity, um, you know, everything in spaces that you can think of that uses energy, but it also can control security systems and other things. We're not going to focus too much on that. Um, so I'm actually going to show you an example of this. So, um, and if you want to, it's, you can log into this as well and take a look around. You can't break anything. Um, it's a view only thing. Um, so you're more than welcome to look at this. So this is actually an example of a building automation system and how it looks. This is for my old college, um, Delaware Tech. Um, and let me just show you a few things. First off, we can see um, right now what the temperatures in all the different rooms are um, in there. And we can even say, okay, let's see, look at let's look at this large room. Um, let's see what the the heater's doing right now. So this is right now the space temperature in the space is 70.8. The set point is 71, so we're pretty darn close to that, which is good. Um, and that's with the thermostat. And then here, the fans on. And um, it's blowing air um, at about 70.4 degrees. And so we can see what's going on. And, and right, right now, it is on heating, but the, the heating is disabled. OK? So you can get an idea as to, and this is just for one little room. All of these controls are just for one little room. So you can get an idea. We might be able to turn this fan down a little bit. We might be able to increase the set point a little bit to help us balance the grid at all times. Right? And again, this could be a, a human-driven process, right? but it also could be an AI-driven process to say, okay, we want to keep people comfortable. How can we do that at all times by using more electricity when it's cheap and plentiful when the sun's shining and the wind's blowing and cutting back when it's not? Okay? So just to give you just one other idea of, of this is what um, actually serves um, the building as well. Um, this is on the roof and it, and it brings in fresh air basically. So there's even more things we could do here too. So there's just all of these different control points already built into buildings. So this isn't something that's like science fiction. It's already built in. And so these are already sort of cyber physical systems that are already built in. And this isn't just for buildings. This is for manufacturing plants as well. All sorts of different things are, are already programmed like this. Um, so it sort of gives you an idea as to um, what's already happening. And then when we connect all of these things to the internet and to AI, um, it could have a big um, potential benefit. Um, so, so that's, again, you want to sort of consider, the, you can consider the building automation system, how that might work um, to help um, balance the grid, especially if we have a lot of these building automation systems running at the same time. Thanks for watching.